here at the Sam Ferris Institute at the American University of Beirut with Remy Hori, um, noted journalist. Uh, thank you for having me today. I uh, just my pleasure. And here to get some scholarly opinions on what's going on in the Middle East, particularly uh, in Lebanon and Syria. Um, it seems that things are somewhat in the end game in Syria. Things uh, seems like Assad is going to prevail. Um, what do you think? the future of Syria looks like at post-conflict? Well, all of those things you said are possibilities. None of them are certainties. It seems like Assad will prevail. He'll stay as president. He will rule over a very divided and probably truncated country. We have no idea what's going to happen to the main opposition groups, which are the Islamic State and then the other um, Islamist militants like uh, Qaeda and uh, mm and Ahrad al-Sham and those guys who are all together now in the Erbil area, uh, and then the secular nationalist uh, uh, Free Syrian Army. So you have three major, and then of course the Kurds, you have four major groups that are against Assad. We have no idea what their fate is going to be. Mm. Uh, but with Russian, Iranian, and Hezbollah support, uh, Assad has been able to um, keep his uh, presidency uh, over a very fractured country. So I don't know if that's if we should call it prevailing or just surviving. It's mm. it will tell, it will not. And if they can come up with a good uh, reconciliation, diplomatic, <coughs> political process, and the country can be more or less reunited <coughs> under a single political leadership with a lot of decentralization, can't rule that out. But it's going to be a hard slog. But if that happens, then um, what you're going to have is a country probably that will be managed very differently than it was in the past, without an uh, all-powerful central government, with much more decentralization, much more pluralism. I mean, that's the ideal. Hmm. Uh, it hasn't happened anywhere in the Arab world except for Tunisia, and that was after a revolution that overthrew the Tunisian leadership. So the chances of it happening in Syria are slim, but they're not zero. Interesting. And, and do, do you think that the uh, new rounds of peace talks in Astana and Geneva it seems that they are doing better than the previous peace talks. Um, they're including more regional powers. Do you think that's the, uh, the key difference, Turkey being involved, Qatar being involved? Do you think that's the difference? That's one difference. It, it adds an element of greater possibility of succeeding because some of the key actors who are involved in the war are involved in the, in the peace talks. Uh, the reality is what happens on the ground. Mm. And if the Russians, Iran and Hezbollah are helping um, Assad uh, maintain his grip on power and weakening the uh, opposition groups, then that creates a different situation in the negotiations and pushes the opposition to try to salvage whatever it can, mm. unless they decide to just fight to the death. Some of them probably will, but most people wouldn't uh, be so reckless. They would try to salvage whatever they can out of the process. Um, and then this is going to be uh, clear uh, maybe in about six, nine months. It's not going to happen very quickly, but each one of these negotiations is a stage on, a, on a, quite a long road. It seems that they're moving in the right direction, ho hopefully, anyway. Well, the fact that they're sitting talking is good. The fact that the key opposition groups are not there is not good. Mm. And the fact that they haven't really reached a breakthrough is not good. So you've got you know, some positive signs and some negative ones. And um, that's the nature of these very brutal conflicts. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned uh, a major player who's not been involved in any peace talk, um, the Kurds. Um, they're involved in both Iraq, Syria, Turkey. They even have uh, issues with Iran. And the Kurds seem to be playing a very dangerous game in terms of fighting. They're cooperating with Assad in some fronts, and uh, they're getting support from various players. Um, what do you think the future of the Kurds in the region is? Do you think they'll ever get their want of a nation state? I think the Kurds eventually will get their own state, but eventually may mean in 500 years or 200 mm -hmm. years. Or, I mean, they are a nation. They are a distinct nation that's has, I don't know, 30 million people or 40 million people, uh, and they will have to have their own country eventually. Um, the moment hasn't come to reconcile the modern Westphalian nation-state order with the 
traditional identities, identities of different ethnic and national groups in this region. So the Kurds will have a state one day. They're moving slowly towards autonomous power in northern Iraq, maybe northern Syria. Turkey and Iran won't want to make any uh, concessions to them. But you never know what happens in the future. You never know what happens in Turkey and Iran. I mean, that's the story of the Middle East in the last 200 years. Mm -hmm. um, very few things are static. A lot of things change. But the Kurds are not unified. So, you know, you can't speak of the Kurds in Syria. I mean, there's different Kurdish groups, some with the Turks, some with the um, Americans, some with other groups, and some on their own. They have different agendas. Um, and um, it, they are suffering the problems that many other people like them have suffered, which is not to have a lot of military power and not to have a lot of diplomatic support, and therefore they're vulnerable to the vagaries of uh, big powers in the region or big powers from abroad. Mm. Interesting. Uh, you know, that's, that's a good distinction that they're not united. Uh, in the United States, we view them as our best friend in the region, but we view them as a monolith, and yeah. I think that's a mistake. Yeah, they are. Even in the areas they control in northern Iraq, they, there's differences between them. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned Westphalian nation-state, and, and that's interesting. Uh, the Treaty of Westphalia and the Thirty Years' War in Europe between Protestants and Catholics all across the, uh, the continent. Um, is the Middle East going through its own Thirty Years' War, Shia versus Sunni, or is this something that's more political and religion is merely a uniform that unites people, but it's political, not religious? It's definitely political and nationalist, not religious. Uh, I, w I wouldn't say that religion is a uniform that unites people. I would say religion is the last resort um, that people turn to when they have no other means of protection or resistance or mobilization or hope, which is common all over the world. I mean, the American Civil Rights Movement was the same. The Af Black African Apartheid Movement, they all turn to religion when they had nothing else, mm. and uh, and they succeeded, both of them. Um, so religion happens to be there for all faiths, and people who are completely helpless and vulnerable um, turn to their gods to help them out. And that's what gods are designed to do. I mean, um, religion plays this great role all over the world. It gives people hope and uh, perseverance when, uh, when they're down and out. Um, so you have different kinds of religious uh, activism, and you have militant groups, you have fighting groups, you have social welfare groups, you have uh, groups that de deal with political participation in civil society. So again, there's a massive uh, range of religious-oriented groups that are active in the public sphere in the, in the Middle East, and, and not just the Arab world. You look at Iran, you look at Turkey, you look at uh, Israel. In, in Israel, they have Jewish groups, uh, Muslim groups, Christian groups. Uh, so it, uh, there's a huge variation, uh, but what's going on here is really the um, the the collapse of the post World War II order that was created by the European colonial powers mostly, um, with a, a bunch of hand-picked local elites that they helped put in power, mm. and that system has finally broken down. It started breaking down in the late 80s, early 90s. The end of the Cold War gave it a big push. The war in Iraq gave it one more big push. Uh, and therefore you have uh, chaos in about five or six countries. Most of the other countries are not in chaos. They're okay, they're getting on with their daily work. People go to school, go to work, go to church, go to mosque, go to this. Uh, but the big problem all over the region is that um, almost no country has been able to develop a sustainable economic model that includes political freedoms and therefore allows for citizens to be self-determinant and to really practice the uh, principle of the consent of the governed in terms of uh, shaping and running their government. Um, only Tunisia really has broken through in that sense, mm. but there's no other uh, uh, country in the region that's done that, no other Arab country. And the non-Arab ones all have their problems. Israel, Turkey, and Iran have certain elements of democratic life, but they all have huge uh, drawbacks as well, so they're not perfect model democracies either. Um, and uh, this is a, a problem that is a, I think it's the aftershocks of, uh, of almost 200 years of European colonial intervention, followed by uh, more recently American uh, colonial intervention. 
or maybe it's not colonial, but it's just military intervention. The right kind of sort of neo. So this, this is a region that's got a lot of accumulated problems, which have been exacerbated by population growth that's much faster than economic growth, uh, poor environmental protection, bad um, management systems by the government, corruption and competence. And then you have two other major factors, which is the continuation of the Arab-Israeli conflict, which really started in the 30s, more or less, uh, almost 100 years of Arab-Israeli uh, conflict, which spills over into so many other problems mm -hmm. in the region. And then you have the nonstop foreign military intervention. Uh, it's been going on since Napoleon came here 200 and some years ago, and it just keeps going. And the Americans have been fighting for 35 years uh, between Afghanistan and Iraq and all over the region. And they're still fighting, and, and now, you know, Trump wants to send more people. And, um, um, so the militarism by foreign parties has been one of the constant, uh, really catastrophic problems in our region. Um, and if you put all these things together with, with some other things, uh, you, this is what you end up with, states that were developing, okay, from 1930 to 1980, and after 1980, it's kind of been going downhill for most of them. Interesting. Um, it seems uh, the... With you saying that the regions, uh, the region had been doing okay, the Arab socialist states, um, they seem to be falling now. You know, uh, or Not just the socialists, the socialists, the monarchies, the republics, all of them so were doing okay. I would say okay, it doesn't mean they were great, but every, most people's lives were improving from 1920 to 1980. Mm. And with any measure you use, there was serious national development across the board. That kind of started to stall in the 80s for many different reasons, and, and, and there's been regression ever since. So if you measure things like educational outputs, labor force participation, democratic uh, change, uh, productivity, uh, per capita income, um, any measure you use, uh, real wealth, disparity, any measure you use shows that we've been going um, either stagnant, we've been stagnant or we're going backwards for the last 30 years or so. And this is one reason you have all these uh, uh, problems of violence, of civil war, of uprisings, of people turning to people other than their government to protect them and to represent them, whether it's uh, Muqtada Sadr in Iraq or the Houthis in Yemen or Hezbollah or Hamas or the, the thousand different rebel groups in Syria. And, uh, everywhere you look around the region, people in these conflicted countries are uh, not turning to their government to take care of them or provide them with the security and the opportunity and services they expect. They're looking to other people. Mm -hmm. And that's a consequence of this breakdown. Absolutely, a challenge to the state. Um, why do you think the monarchies in the region have still, uh, or why, why do you think the monarchies in the region are stable and have kind of uh, made it past the Arab Spring, whereas the Ba'athists and the Arab socialist states have fallen, in a way, to the Arab Spring? Well, I think that's a bit too much of a generalization. generalization. I think some of the monarchies are so wealthy with such small populations like Kuwait, UAE, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, they have so much money that they can essentially give their people everything they need in terms mm -hmm. of material needs, and that quiets people down. And therefore, you haven't had real uprisings in those countries. Yes, I You've had right. some uh, uh, that are based on accusations of sectarian discrimination like the Shia in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. uh, Bahrain, uh, Jordan, uh, Morocco, uh, are a different, uh, different story. Bahrain, you had a terrible uprising, which is still going on. Uh, Jordan has not had a, had a little tiny uprising, but uh, with a serious discontent among uh, vulnerable citizens, marginalized citizens, and, but they can't really muster the numbers to come up with any kind of major uprising. But there is political tension, and the government understands it's trying to deal with it. It hasn't done very well. And Morocco is probably the best example of a state with, that has the, a monarchy that has the least kind of disruption, uh, but there's you know huge uh, social welfare problems in, in Morocco. There's still the the king still controls things. You have a um, so sort of democratic participation system with a parliament and even the the Islamists who are in the government and were leading the government at one point. I mean, this is not a real democracy. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a kind of controlled democracy. It's like kind of what Iran has. 
Yeah. Uh, so, um, so the the monarchies aren't in such great shape. The the one thing that is different about most monarchies is because they're monarchies, there is a sense among the monarchs that they need to pay attention to their people. Uh, I don't know why that is. Uh, the the monarchs that I've spoken to uh, have basically feel they have to earn their incumbency. Mm. Uh, because the idea of monarchy is not one that most people accept. I mean, you know, why should somebody have total power just because they're the son of the previous monarch? I mean, that's an idea that went out of, you know, uh, went out of favor in the world about 200 years ago, uh, except uh, here and in a few other places. So monarchs feel they have to earn their legitimacy, so they tend to try to pay attention um, in, in, in poor monarchies like Jordan and, and Morocco, where the monarchs are much more attentive to uh, concerns of people. They haven't provided the political response that's needed to have really functional democracies, but they've done a little bit better than some of the wealthy monarchies that can maintain uh, stability and incumbency simply by throwing money at everything. Mm. Interesting. Mm. Um. Yeah, it's fascinating. The monarchies are uh, really interesting to study. Yeah, de uh, definitely. Um, in your in the previous question, you mentioned groups that are uh, challengers to governments um, in terms of legitimacy. Uh, Hezbollah, most notably. Um. They don't necessarily challenge the government's legitimacy. They are co-legitimate with the government, right. so they coexist with the government. In fact, they're in the government. Yes, yes. In uh, some cases, like Hamas or Hezbollah or the Houthis or Muqtada the Sadr, they play the game. They're part of the government, but they have their own reality as well. A absolutely. So they're not trying to overthrow the government. No, no, but um, do you think that Hezbollah will emerge stronger or weaker from the Syrian civil war? It's hard to tell. It depends yeah. what happens in Syria, depends what happens in Israel, and depends what happens in Lebanon and Iran as well. Mm. Uh, it's very hard to tell, but they have proven to be very um, strong and persistent. So they're smart people, they're not uh, wild men, they know what they're doing, they have strategic planning, they, they look at all possibilities. My guess is they'll uh, probably stay more or less as they are mm. for, for quite a while. Interesting. Um, interesting. Because it's not so long ago that they somewhat gave the Israelis a bloody nose in uh, 2006 in mm. southern Lebanon, and I'm just wondering the effects of whether the effects of battle experience will benefit them or whether the casualties will mean more to them. Um, and It's hard to tell mm. uh, until we see what the situation is in the future, but they've been able to take the casualties they've suffered in Syria without any major damage. There's been some grumblings we hear about here and there, but nothing serious. They've obviously been able to handle that situation. And um, they've learned uh, new things in terms of their battlefield experience, but it's not what they've learned in, you know, in Aleppo and, and, uh, and uh, you know, west of Damascus is not necessarily the kind of battle they're going to fight with Israel. That's uh, true. And I think there's a pretty much a deterrence now between Israel and Hezbollah. They, they both understand that if there were to be another war, it's going to be really damaging to both sides with massive amounts of civilians killed. And, and it's not worth it for either of them. And neither side can defeat the other, so to speak. Mm. So there's a deterrence now there that uh, probably will keep the border as it is now, with minor little incidents here and there, but no major warfare to be expected. Unless one side gets uh, desperate and does something crazy, the Israelis or Hezbollah, but I don't think uh, that's likely. Mm. That, that's hopeful. That's a hopeful note. I, I was shocked to see uh, last week in the Daily Star Nasrallah saying there will be no war, war with Israel in 2017, and, and I was shocked that he would even bring that up, you know, but... Uh, well, that's from, for him, that's a sign of confidence. He's saying yeah. we're so strong that the Israelis aren't going to uh, dare to make a war because they'll suffer so badly if they do. So he says that in a way to show his confidence in, um, in their capabilities. Uh, but you can never tell what happens in the future. Sometimes wars get sparked uh, accidentally. That's true. Which is a stupid way to live, but it happens sometimes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of uh, democracy in the region, um, Turkey was somewhat a great hope for the West, um, a, a secular nation um, and a functioning democracy. Well, it wasn't a secular form. nation, it was a secular government. R right, exactly. The secularization was only skin deep, uh, and we're seeing that now uh, with uh, Erdogan 
rolling back some of uh, Ataturk's mentalities. Um, do you think that Erdogan will become more of a strong man, or do you think that the functioning democracy of Turkey will survive him? I can't answer that. Nobody knows. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the trend has been that the democrat democratic trend was very impressive for about 15 years. There's been a regression now in the last couple of years, especially after the attempted coup. Um, but there'll be pushback within uh, Turkish society. A lot of these things depend on the economy, depending on regional issues, Syria, the Kurds, what the Russians do. Um, my guess is that the, the Turkish transition towards a pretty credible democracy was, uh, was both impressive and genuine. Um, now, th this ro rollback has been very much spearheaded by Erdogan rather than by grassroots sentiments. So we, we don't know how deep uh, is the sentiment in society to preserve the democratic gains that they made, or whether they're happy to have a strong man who boasts and uh, acts tough and jails tens of thousands of people. Uh, we honestly don't know, but we'll find out with the referendum soon uh, yeah. and, and next elections. Absolutely. Um, and uh, just a final question uh, for you, much less technical, uh, more personal. Um, do you have hope for the region in the next 20 years? Do you think it's moving in the right direction? Well, most of the region is moving in the right direction. Some of it's moving in the wrong direction. So what you have in the, in the Middle East is 400 million Arabs. About 320 million of them get up every day and have an animal life. They go to work, they go to school, they go to the playground, they go to the movies, they, they play uh, soccer, you know, they, they just have a pretty normal life. They're not wealthy, most of them, but they get down and very few people, if any, are dying of, uh, of hunger. The only ones dying of hunger are in places like Syria where they're besieged or Yemen where the Saudis with American help have conducted this gruesome war. Mm. Um, so most of the Arab world is, is living a, a, a normal but not progressing life. It's the, they have a, a pretty reasonable situation, but they're not making political or economic or social gains. It's pretty static, as it was for most of the last 50 years under the autocratic regimes. I would say about 70, 80 million people live in pretty uh, war-torn, um, vulnerable, fragmenting, and violent societies. And we know the reasons for this. None of this happened simply because some Arabs woke up one day and decided to become violent. Um, the Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, 50 years of autocracy, foreign militarism. And foreign militarism now, by the way, is not what it used to be. In the, in, in the past, it used to be you know, the Israelis, the Americans, the British, the French, essentially, would occasionally have wars with Arabs. Now you've got the Russians, you've got the Turks, you've got the Iranians all in there fighting, and you've got people like the Saudis and others fighting in other countries. So for mili external military intervention has now become very widespread, mm -hmm. and it's much more complex to, to solve this now than it was before. But we still know why we are in this situation. We know how we got here, we know the reasons, and we know the actors. So it can be solved in a political solution uh, one day, which I think will happen probably when either some, but one side wins or when there's exhaustion. You know, if you can solve Northern Ireland and South Africa, you can solve most of the Arab problems. Um, so we'll have to just wait and see. But broadly speaking, I'm uh, optimistic in the sense that I know from living here the last 50 years that the average Arab person wants exactly the same thing as the average European or American or, or African or other person, they just want to live a normal life and be treated decently. They don't want to be treated like animals or like colonial subjects um, by their regime or by foreign uh, invaders and colonizers. Um, so I'm pretty hopeful because in the end, the, the pressure from you know hundreds of millions of people insisting on a life of dignity and hope, um, that pressure will, will have an impact. And we saw the first hint of this in 2010 and 11 with the uprisings. Absolutely. That was an amazing experience, which people, I think, haven't fully digested yet. When, when people in seven or eight or more countries spontaneously rose up and challenged their autocratic regimes. Uh, that was a first, uh, you know, first hint, and I think there will be other ways that Arab people in the future will manifest their insistence on achieving their rights as full human beings and full citizens. Uh, how they do that, nobody can guess. 
but, but you can be sure that they will do it. And that's why I'm pretty hopeful for the future. But between now and the future, there's going to be some rough, rough years, unfortunately. Absolutely. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, well, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, All right. Good luck. Really appreciate it. My pleasure.